Um, this is an introduction, basic introduction to butterfly ID. I'm Deborah Sazer. I'm, a, amongst other things, a butterfly ecologist. Been working on butterflies for many years now. Um, top whistle stop tour. So I'm just going to crack on with our program. So I am going to be talking about butterflies of Southeast Wales. I think there's people from all over on this course, but we're going to concentrate on Southeast Wales. Um, other butterflies, and I have just um, um, got a small picture and a little bit, um, a little bit of information about them in the corner of the screen, but I'm not going to go through details about how to identify them. Um, so we're going to start, I'm going to start by just looking at the difference between, or difference or not between butterflies and moths, which is one of the questions that people always ask. Um, quickly go through information about their ecology. I could talk about that all day. Um, uh, show you some ID guides and other useful resources. There's lots of information out there. And then get on to the meat of the day, which is, so to speak, to mix metaphors, which is butterfly ID. And um, I just wanted to start off straight away and thank all the photographers that have um, kindly let me use their photos, particularly Peter Eels from UK Butterflies. And all of the photographs that don't have a credit on them are, are by him. So, excuse me. Um, um, Lepidoptera cover butterflies and moths. We've got 42 <laughs> butterfly species in Wales. And um, so both butterflies and moths have tiny scales that reflect color. It's called structural color. So they're not actually colored themselves. Um, and it's just the pattern and the way, the way they're arranged that reflects the different wavelengths. So we've got a, um, a green vein white here, it's more and more magnified. And then the top right, we've got, um, it's actually a peacock butterfly with, under a um, electron microscope. And they both have uh, their um, tongue is called a proboscis, and it's very long. And cur they curl it, tuck it up under their where their chin would be if they had a chin. And again, a fantastic um, electron microscope image um, showing all the little sort of receptacles that, that are, I guess, the equivalent of their taste buds. Um, thanks to Dave Slade from Subrec for um, lending me this um, slide. So if you did his uh, moths or macromoths courses. You've already seen this slide several times, but um, just to show the kind of evolutionary relatedness of all the Lepidoptera, and you can see the butterflies just come in the middle. They're not they're not distinguished out from all moths, um, so there isn't any really clear difference. Butterflies have clubbed antennae, so that's in the top um, top left. You can see that middle. Uh, middle image is a butterfly antenna. Um, whereas, uh, but moths can have either very you know, thin antennae or some of the male moths have these fabulous feathery antennae, which, um, by which they can um, smell or sense pheromones. So butterflies are generally day flying, but they do turn up in moth traps at night. Um, a lot of, most of them are bright, brightly colored. You can see at the bottom, that's a dingy skipper butterfly that is not, is very moth-like, not brightly colored. And they usually shut their wings above their bodies when they're resting, but not all of them. Moths, a whole range of things. Some of them are brown and drab. Some of them are fabulous shapes like the thorn moths. And then the two at the bottom that you can see are, um, are really brightly colored. Um, most are nocturnal, but there are many day fly moths, and they hold their wings in different sorts of positions. Um, butterflies have relatively thin bodies, and the females, as you can see on the left, on this marsh fritillary, its um, abdomen is wider than the males because she's the one that carries the eggs, of course. Moths tend to have thinner bodies, but not always, as the elephant hawk moth on the right shows. It's got a very thick body. So there you go, no really clear difference. Um, sorry, I can hear James Taylor talking. James Taylor, please switch off your microphone. Um, 
I'm sure you all know, everybody remembers the butterfly life cycle. We've got orange dip butterflies here as an example. They mate, the female um, on the bottom right lays the eggs, in this case on, um, I think that's cuckoo flower. And you can see the tiny egg. Oh, the arrow's gone a bit wonky, the tiny egg here. And you can actually look for these on, 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 on their various food plants um, and see the little eggs close up of it. Caterpillar hatches out, eventually pupates, and then the next year in their case, because they only have one generation a year, it emerges as a butterfly. So this is a, um, one of the main, the main divisions or the main way of looking at butterfly ecology that we've got our wider countryside species, the, the sort of what people see um, with broader habitat requirements. Um, their habitat is fairly plentiful. Um, they do use linear habitats as well, so they to help them disperse between habitat patches. And they um, aren't, aren't restricted. They have a range of larval food plants, like several different grass species. Again, we'll see this later. Um, they're very mobile, fast flying, and um, they tend to have more than one brood a year. So all those things help them to prosper specialists which are much stricter in their habitat requirements so they tend to be in habitat islands that are isolated from um, other habitat patches tend to be quite localized um, they don't use linear habitats and they are, are more dispersed as much um, and they rely on one or maybe two larval food plants so those are the foods that the plants that the caterpillars feed on and they um, very often only have one generation as well. Um, I was going to do you a bit of a summary of some of the talks in the um, last that from the last butterfly conservation symposium a few years ago about particularly about climate change and butterfly trends, but I um, I was thought we didn't have enough time. I've got the slides at the end if we have time, but this is just a brief summary. Um, so you can you can read those for yourself. They're pretending they're emerging um, earlier on average. Some generalists are able to expand, like orange tip and comma, which have moved north. Really, but most of them are not really tracking climate change. Um, like the habitat specialists, there might be habitat suitable for them for the north, but they can't get there because they don't fly that far. Um, somebody called Mina's microphone is on, I think. Uh-huh. Um, um, what might you do? Uh, um, bottom, bottom left, there's a little microphone symbol. And if you click it, it then should have a line through it. Um, so, and some other um, southern species are moving north. Also, northern cold adapted species. So, things like the mountain ringlet in, in um, Scotland are moving north or they're moving uphill but out of cold habitats um, and so most are not tracking climate change and that's combined with all the other pressures that they've been suffering from over the last 50 100 years of habitat loss fragmentation of their habitat the lack of appropriate management um, and then just the one um, um, graph showing you that it's not just the habitat specialists are declining, they're just declining um, more seriously. And that's over their 40 um, year period. Side species are also suffering a really serious decline. So, butterflies have various needs, and the ones in red on the right are the things that, that really can restrict their. Um, distribution so that the adults do need nectar to feed on but they're not particularly fussy about what species that is. Um, they need somewhere to shelter in bad weather and they need sites to overwinter if for the ones that do overwinter as adults. Um, but what's really critical is the um, food plant for the caterpillars, usually leaves of the particular plant occasionally flowers, um, the habitat and the uh, correct habitat management uh, Ray McMahon, I think your mic might be on as well. I keep getting a little mess. Sorry, I keep, I'm, this isn't flowing very well, but can everybody please make sure you've switched it off? 
on the bottom left of your screen. There's a little microphone symbol. Okay, so just and just an example of a um, butterfly to energy for the adults, basically. That's the main thing. It's just sugar to give them the energy to fly around and mate. I think it probably also contributes to the development of sperm and eggs. Um, and the caterpillar that's actually feeding on the fertility, feeding on violets. And just to quickly, really quickly speak about management. So grassland butterflies, um, the sword height is often very important. And the graph just shows you just that um, from short, going from on the left of the graph to the right, short to long, the different species and even different generations of the same species uh, prefer different grass heights, grass lengths. It's also the structure of the grassland opposite they need a tessicky habitat with some short and some long scrub for um, shelter and grazing is often the is, is usually the best management for that because it's gradual and creates that tessicky structure and then our woodland butterflies um, that require some sort of opening up of woodlands they are actually aren't aren't species of deep woodlands, or they're species of woodland edges and rides and gaps in the woodland. So with the abandonment of coppicing, abandonment of traditional management, and also the fragmentation of woodlands, um, they are also really struggling. So, so field guides really helps um, you know, I just, that's how, that's how, well, I learned in the olden days before we had apps, and I will talk about apps too, but there's lots and lots of really good um, butterfly ID guides. All of the three uh, um, uh, that I've shown you in large are um, really useful. You'll come across Richard Lewington's name a lot here. He's, he's just the best um, insect illustrator I think we've got in the UK. So there he um, illustrates the pocket guide on the left. And then the other two books are photographic guides. I've um, just shown you the, so there's two Collins guides, Collins Complete Guide to British Butterflies and Moths. And then I've shown you smaller, the Collins Butterfly Guide to the um, Butterflies of um, Britain and Europe. And as a beginner, I would not recommend that because there are so many more species in there, many, many, many more. So you'll just be terribly confused um, finding um, dozens and dozens of blues when you're just you're trying to identify a common blue or a holly blue, one of our more common blue butterflies. Um, also, the Field Studies Council produce, they produce these um, laminated fold-out guides, very cheap, I think they're three pounds fifty, um, to all sorts of all sorts of groups and species, but there's a butterfly guide, and they're really handy and you can take them out and they're laminated, so they're fairly weatherproof, really useful. Um, further interest, the sort of, um, I don't want to call it a Bible, but the Thomas and Lewington butterflies of Britain and Ireland has been the kind of, you know, real strong resource with lots of detailed information. And then Peter Eels, my favorite photographer, has um, just recently published Life Cycles of British and Irish Butterflies. Um, so these are both sort of hard, big hardback books. Um, and the life cycles is just fabulous. It's got photographs of all the different stages. So it shows you, might even have like multiple pictures of the eggs as they mature and change color. And then it shows you all the stages. So all insects have their equivalent of a skeleton on the outside of their bodies, unlike us with it on the inside. So they can't grow. So when they need to grow, they need to, as you, I'm sure you know, they to shed their skin and um, grow again and develop and harden the outer uh, shell again, the chitin, it's made out of what's called chitin. Um, and each of those steps is called an instar. And so this book has photographs of all the different instars of um, all the butterflies. So it's really useful, lots and lots and lots of detailed information. And then an even newer guide is the field guide caterpillars and that's butterflies and moths, which is really fantastic, but it's only showing you the usually I think the final instar of, um, of the caterpillars. So they can look very different as they develop. So, um, but it's all the butterflies and moths. So they're both around, that's a paperback book. 
Um, and um, there are a number of ID apps. Um, the um, three on the bottom I've not used. Um, they're all at a price, but Butterfly Conservation and iRecord have a free app that you can download on all formats. Um, and it's got um, summaries of descriptions and, and some photos of each butterfly. So it's helpful for um, identification. And then you can also just record directly. Um, and um, perhaps we can um, send out to people a few copies of these slides so you don't have to try to write this down. Butterfly Conservation's website is full of all sorts of useful information on ID and education and there's loads of information you can download um, and lots of information about how to record butterflies because that is the point of this. This is being um, kindly held by our um, Southeast Wales Biological Records Centre, Biodiversity Records Centre, I can't remember which. Uh, no, um, it's really important that you do record. Um, in South Wales, we've got um, our own volunteer branch. Um, and um, when people are allowed to go out and do things, they organize um, a number of um, targeted, uh, particularly brown hair streak surveys in Southwest Wales. Um, they also monitor um, and manage the one high brown fertility site in Wales, and you can um, normally they'll arrange days where people can come and see the high browns, and they have a, a really really interesting and, and and entertaining members meeting in, in the autumn. There's also a North Wales um, branch as well, and then UK butterflies. I keep <laughs> I keep going on. This is the site that Peter Eels started, um, and um, it's sort of similar. What I think it's a lot of it is what's in the was in that book that it's got loads and loads of photos and information. And it's got um, a page you can look at it to see what's actually flying now. And I think actually I just noticed, um, I think Butterfly Conservation have this on their site as well, which is really useful to check what's actually flying now so that you're not wasting time trying to identify something, uh, an orange tip late in the year when they're a spring butterfly. That is um, the proviso that with warm weather and things changing, some species are starting to have more than one generation that wouldn't normally, but in general. And then this is your homework. So everybody has to do this homework or you're not allowed to be on the course. Um, the big butterfly count, which is a what's called citizen science, trying to get as many people as possible. I think they've got over 10,000 people, oh, 10,000 records so far, probably even more. Um, but it finishes on Sunday. So you've got three days, beautiful weather for this weekend. You can download um, this free app um, that again has identification information and you can record directly onto the app or you can record on their website. Um, and then other butterfly surveys you can get involved in. Again, go to Butterfly Conservations. Um, website and they have a regular garden butterfly survey, migrant watch, wider countryside butterfly survey, which is how we know that those wider countryside butterflies are declining because lots of people do surveys every year, um, every year except this year. And, um, and then the UK butterfly monitoring scheme, which is a more targeted um, scheme where you, you visit the same site every week over the whole flight period and provides a huge, really important range of um, data. And, and records are so important because all, all of this information that we know about butterflies and all the things that they're telling us is a kind of flagship for what's going on with climate change. Almost all of that comes from volunteer records. So do submit your records. Um, butterflies, you can submit them um, directly to your local um, Butterfly recorder with Dave Slade from Sue Breck, um, but you can just record them um, directly either at South, uh, Sue Breck's website or there are um, these free apps that told you about. I record butterflies. I record is for all the UK and Lurk Wales is for all of Wales. And I just need a drink. So. Finally, we get to butterfly identification. I apologize for this photograph of South African butterflies. The only one, only one I could find showing butterflies actually flying. So just really important points to remember is you see a butterfly, you look it up, you're trying to figure out what it is. 
definitely look at what time of year it flies. As I mentioned, with the orange tips, there can be, like I've heard of a dingy skipper as a spring butterfly. So I'd normally say if you see that in August, um, you should just make sure you double check that because you could, you could be mistaken. However, I have seen that people in England um, in the young children's are, have been seeing second generation um, dingy skippers at the moment. So, but it gives you, you know, at least gives you good pointers. Um, and also definitely have a look. Most map, most books or apps will have a little map or, or describe um, the region um, where they're found. And if you think you've seen a checkered skipper in South Wales, then you will be wrong because they're only in Scotland. Introduction program going on in Northampton, but they're um, not in the UK. There is one problem where people release butterflies and um, a horrible um, trend of people releasing them at weddings and things. So that can also confuse things when some very strange things turn up. I've shown if we were going to be out actually doing a real course and going out in the field, which is what we had planned to do the Sue Greg this year, um, is to just show you what they actually look like out in the field and the way they fly, what, what bird watchers call jizz that can really really help a very graceful gliding flight like marbled white and then some of them just really skit along. But we will do the best we can. So we've got five, we've actually got three families in Wales, but divided them up into five groups that help you identify them, five fairly similar groups. So we'll start with the whites and the yellows, the white butterflies that everybody knows, at least some of them. Um, you can read the details about them on the left. I don't want to read everything out to you. They are butterflies of the wider countryside. And again, we see the orange tip, beautiful harbinger of spring. Um, got the male with the orange spots on its wings, unmistakable. Um, the female is, I'll show you, coming up, how you tell the difference between that, that female and the other whites. And then if they land, if they do quite a lot, you can see their underside and there's nothing else like that with that green mottling. Brief mention of the wood white butterfly. Uh, there's, there's some uncertain records of it in South Wales and Mid Wales, but as far as we know, it's really only been confirmed right on the border in, in the Wye Valley from, from England. Um, and it's got quite a different look to it. So. Um, so here are four white, white butterflies. <laughs> um, so we've got the two small white and the large white that are the garden white butterflies. They are really hard to tell apart and size is not a good guide. I, I do worry that a lot of our records are just because people see something flying and they think, oh, that looks large, it must be large white. And it isn't necessarily, it can be quite deceptive. I think individuals, I think individuals can vary a bit in size, but um, unless they land, which they don't that often, um, it's very hard to tell. If they do land, then it is not so hard to tell. And if you can see the little red bar, the small white, the, the, this patch, which can be quite light gray or darker, almost a black, only comes short, whereas in the large white, it comes a much longer way down. So that's the key to tell the difference. Um, the green veined white doesn't have the black spots on its wings. And you can actually often even see, you can see the veins even from the top, if you can see those sort of grayish looking veins. The female orange tip, um, it has these um, white sort of stripes or gaps in the black. Uh, so, so you can, basically you can see the white veins is what you can see on the black marking. So that's quite, that does look quite different. Um, the undersides, and one of the things, so you're not going to learn to identify all these butterflies today, obviously by any, by any way, but um, what I hope that will stick with you are the sort of features. Sides are really important in getting to know what butterflies undersides look like, underwings look like is, um, is a really useful way, it gives you a whole extra um, way of identifying them. And it's, you know, when they are stopping and nectaring or resting, so you get a chance to actually have a look. So, and as we can see, the small white and the large white are really hard to tell apart because they both just have this pale yellow wing. 
um, often you can see the markings um, and look for that same pattern, but um, on their stalk. Um, the green veined white has these really clear, and obviously you can see them from quite, quite a distance, um, green veins, so dark green veins, and then we've seen orange tip on the bottom right. Um, I recommend watching our close focusing binoculars because if you do approach, they will fly away. They are, they can drive you mad. They do always fly away when you're trying to identify them. And if you're somewhere hilly, they inevitably fly uphill and they can fly much faster than you can run. So that can be very frustrating. And also they, um, if you see them often just sort of bombing around, flying, 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 looking, 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 and that's usually the males. Males spend their lives looking for females because that's, that's what they do. That's their purpose in life to mate. The females, once they've mated, um, more eggs and be left alone. So they tend to be, both they tend to be less brightly colored in many species, but they also tend to be just sort of more discreet and they're only kind of out and about when they want to lay eggs. So when you see those things just madly flying along, looking, um, looking just a bit um, overwhelmed with testosterone, those are the males. Um, so People think of white butterflies as garden pests. In fact, it's only the large white and small white that feed on um, garden cultivated um, plants from the family of Brassicaceae or crucifers, or cabbages, obviously, also nasturtiums. Um, the large white is the one that's more of a, of a problem if you do grow cabbages because they lay, um, the female lays a whole batch of eggs on one leaf. Whereas a small white only lays one at a time. So even the small white isn't that much of a problem. I solved this by not growing cabbages, but I'm sure that won't suit everybody. The other white butterflies that we've been looking at, the orange strip and green vein white, they only lay their eggs on wild uh, members of the same family. So flowers like cuckoo flower, garlic mustard, and hedge mustard. Um, then the two sort of yellow members of this family that we get are the brimstone resident. That's one of the butterflies that overwinters as, a, as an adult. So that, that's why we see them um, early in the spring. And in fact, the butterflies that you do see quite early in the year, those are all ones that have overwintered as adults. Bright, creamy yellow, and they've got a very distinctive leaf shape. So they look very different to the other, um, uh, the other butterflies in this family. And um, they're quite big, quite graceful flying along hedgerows and places like that. There's an immigrant, clouded yellow, that turns up some years in quite good numbers. I haven't seen one in ages. And they're quite bright yellow and they're upper size. They have darker markings on them. Again, I've seen people recording a few of them in England. Um, and they do breed um, sometimes on the south coast of England. And um, I know I've uh, some uh, reliable friend has told me that she's seen them um, on early in the year, so they probably did breed in milder winters, but um, it's probably too cold for them otherwise. Right, then we move on to the other more familiar garden butterflies of the Vanessids, um, which are part of the Nymphalidae family. Um, Again, open countryside, quite strong flying butterflies. Um, the painted lady, um, which feeds on all kinds of thistle. And I don't have time to talk about gardening for wildlife and gardening for butterflies, but I will say thistles are, are a plant that a lot of people don't like, but they're so important to butterflies and all sorts of other pollinators as well. So um, do, do grow some thistles. Um, they're they fly from as far as even south of the Sahara, all the way up to the UK. Not the same individuals, but they will breed and then um, they'll move north and maybe breed again in maybe even North Africa, the north coast of Africa or in southern Europe, and then they might breed again and move to northern Europe and then eventually they come here. But in the in the autumn, they fly all the way back. The same individuals will fly all the way back. So it's an amazing for this little butterfly. And just to mentor remind me, there was a talk um, on the, if you can see a, a video of it on the Field Studies Council 
um, YouTube site. So Will Hawks from Exeter University is studying um, insect migration. Um, and he said he's reported, he's seen absolutely millions of small white butterflies moving north, or white butterflies um, flying north in the spring. And also red admirals, millions and millions, both through the Pyrenees, through the Alps, and also, also through Cyprus. They're coming around through the Mideast, and then they fly over. And all of these are flying over big expanses of water um, and flying north. And it's just amazing, things that we, we hadn't known until recently. And these are the other four members, familiar members. Well, like, so go back to just how do I D. So um, the Painted Lady is quite orangey, and I, I feel it always looks like it's a little faded. Um, and then with the strong black and white tips. Um, the Red Admiral, more really bright orange, uh, bright orange-red um, stripes to it, similar wing tips. Um, small tortoiseshell has those um, kind of sergeant stripes along the top of its wings. Bright orange, little little blue dots around the bottom of its lower wings. Comma is very easy to identify because it's got very very jagged wings. It's like birds have bitten lots of pieces out of it. And then the peacock is unmistakable with its with its eyes that are thought to be used as um, to deter predators if they have their wings closed and suddenly open them that that, that a predator thinks that it's something looking at it and shocks it and it flies away allegedly. And they all feed on nettles. So again, do grow some nettles and allow nettles to grow in your garden in a sunny position, not in the shade, but in the sun. And um, you may well be lucky enough to have these um, uh, laying eggs in your garden. And undersides, again, the themes of the day. So if you learn to recognize those undersides, then you have all, it's like learning bird song. It gives you a, a whole extra way of identifying butterflies. Red Admiral usually stops with its upper wings showing, so that's, that's a help. Small tortoise shell has this sort of quite lighter um, outer edge to the underside. Peacock's really dark, and even when it flies, often I just all you see is a is a something flying by, but it looks really dark. It really looks different than the others. And comma again with its um, uh, very jaggedy edge, and also the little light comma on its lower wing that gives it its name. So on to the browns. Start with the brown that isn't brown. These are these are ones the ones with really kind of lazy, elegant flight, and most of these are found in tall grass. Marble white, gorgeous, unmistakable butterfly. Very strange distribution where it feeds on grasses, but it's missing from lots of lots of sites that look suitable, and then um, pops up in other sites. One of my favorites. Um, and here's our very common and me familiar meadow brown butterfly, which is a brown butterfly. And it's only the, in this case, unusually, the female is more brightly colored. It's only the female that has orange patches on her wings. Um, and then they both have a little, they have a black spot with a little white spot and the, the spot of males. They do look very orange when they fly. They look sort of oranger than they really are when they fly. They have quite an orange look and it can make it difficult to tell them apart from some of the others, um, such as the gatekeeper. Um, the gatekeeper um, comes out a bit later, July. It, it, it's, it, it's a more sum, real summer butterfly, um, whereas meadow brown starts coming out. I actually saw it in May this year, um, May, June. Um, gatekeeper's smaller, it's got brown edge, more orange on its wings, and then these thick brown edges, and it does tend to be around hedges and um, edges of fields and, and much more. Um, and it's got two little white dots on its wings, so if you do see it stalked and you've just got the meadow brown for comparison, um, then you can see those two white spots. And I just wanted to point out, the males have these dark patches on the upper wings, which are called sex brands. Um, and they actually emit pheromones from them. There's a number of butterflies that have these, but it's really obvious there, so I thought I'd point that out. Um, and the other really common brown butterfly is the ringlet. So when they're flying, it can be hard to tell a ringlet from a, especially a male, meadow brown, very difficult. But um, 
when they're, especially when they're fresh, the males are very, very dark. And unless they're very worn, you can see that white fringe along the edge of the wings that the matter brown does not have, um, even when they're flying quite often. So, and once they land, they've got those rings, um, which is obvious how things on their under, underside, so they're you know, unmistakable. Um, and then we've got the small heath butterfly, which is very bright orange. It's very small. It is a small butterfly. It can look quite big when it's like, oh, what's that? Oh, big orange butterfly. And then it lands and you think, oh, it's just oh, it's a little, um, little, little butterfly. Um, another grassland species. Um, oh, I forgot to mention this. I just highlighted it just to remind me. This S7 just means that it's um, a Section 7 species in West so Wales. are species of conservation concern in Wales. I think they're called um, Section 42 species in the UK. Small heath, I think, was put on this list um, to um, just um, emphasize that it's more reclining, but we don't know enough about them. So it's not necessarily um, of conservation concern, but, but we don't know that. Um, large heath only in the uplands of Northwest Wales. So I'm not going to um, give a bigger description about that. And again, undersides. I'm just showing you again what I've already said about the, the eye spot can help you um, tell the difference. And just the different, the, the undersides of the gatekeeper are quite, are um, much more strongly marked. Ringlet and small heath, small heath. I, I think small heath probably always or almost always shows its upper wing. So that's, those are good ways of telling them apart from the meadow browns, which are a bit more nondescript. And the speckled wood, another very common species. I've just shown you first and second generation, just to, I, ha I haven't, mentioned that before, a number of these species, like the white butterflies, actually do look a bit different in different generations. Um, but you can see it with the speckled wood, it doesn't, it doesn't, it, they're just as easy to identify. They're unmistakable dark butterfly with the pale patches. Sometimes they can be very whitish, sometimes they can be orangey. Um, and they like gap of light, so they're the edges of, edges of hedgerows, edges of woodlands, edges of shrubs. And um, the males will actually peat for dappled white. That's where they, they kind of hang out hoping to catch a female um, flying past. So dappled light is an is a important resource for them and you sometimes you'll see them chasing each other. They'll um, sort of spin round and round each other, fly up as they're fighting each other. That could also be a male trying to mate with a female, a, a reluctant female. Um, and then the less common Browns, um, wall brown I think used to be used to be a wider countryside butterfly, but they both really declined. So that they're now only pretty much only found on our coasts or um, uh, places like quarries, really warm, open habitats. And we definitely we do have them on our South Wales coasts. I usually see them as a kind of pale brown butterfly that just flits past or gets blown past, past the cliff edge in the wind, so um, they can be hard to identify unless they actually do stop. They both have um, orange wings with, with dark markings, of very dark veins on them. The grayling has the brown fringes. Um, and um, I'm sorry, I couldn't find a, a better lit picture of the underside of the wall brown, but their undersides are fairly different. Wall brown has um, these sort of ringed spots. So if they stop, then you can, you can tell the what they are pretty, pretty clearly. They're both special butterflies. You don't need to memorize all this. It was just to show you all these, all these brown species and also the skippers that I'm going to go on to. They all feed on various um, species of grasses to just show you all the different, um, all these different grasses that are suitable for all sorts of different butterflies and all the butterflies have more than one grass that they can lay their eggs on, which is why. Um, most of them are so widespread, or helps them be widespread. Right, now we're on to the less common and um, harder to separate in some cases for tillaries. I forgot to mention that the big butterfly count only um, looks at the more common species. Um, 
and um, you can send you records in if you see other things as well, but you don't have to be able to identify all the rare species and fritillaries to do it, just have a go. And um, I also forgot to mention, it's only 15 minutes, go out anywhere, your garden, the park, go for a walk, um, and just record everything you see in 15 minutes, and you can do it as many times as you like. Um, sorry about that. Okay, so fritillaries then. So they um, are all orange and black, and they all have checkers or spots. Um, and a lot of them are very fast flying, very hard, hard to identify just because you don't see them stopped and they'll just whiz past. Um, and most of them are quite large. Um, most of them are um, species of woodland edges and woodland clearings, um, but not all. And bracken is important for a number of the woodland ones. But as um, uh, when the bracken is dead, particularly on the ground, it just provides a very warm and drier spot for them to rest. And um, so that so, so dead bracken is, a, is an important part of their habitat. Um, so we've got the silver wash fertility, which is um, a, a bit more, especially. Uh, you know, it's, it looks slightly, it, it looks more different than the other large fritillaries. I don't know how to say that. And again, just to mention that the, um, it's another species where the male has these sex friends. Um, this, this is one of the only butterflies that has a, in the UK, or the only one possibly. They actually have a, a whole courtship ritual where they sort of dance around each other, the males and the females, on woodland, you know, typically on a woodland ride. Um, Fabulous, gorgeous butterflies. Bit, bit easier maybe to see um, in the right habitat than the other large fritillaries. And then their undersides are quite distinctive with these silver sort of strips on them on their undersides. Um, the dark green fritillary and the high brown fritillary are almost impossible to tell apart um, unless you can see their undersides. So dark green fritillary is actually quite widespread. Um, but again, so fast flying that I'm sure it's under recorded. Um, and um, yeah, again, you know, that quite that similar orange um, upper wings um, with um, spots, lighter spots on their underwings. But you can see that the um, dark green fertility does look very greenish when you see it, um, its undersides when it stops. And that's the only way to really distinguish it from the high brown fertility. High brown fertility, we've only got one site in Wales, which as I said, you can visit with the um, South Wales Waterfowl Conservation Branch. And um, you need a license to catch them. So um, the only way you can really identify them usually is to catch them. So don't catch them. Um, then it's slightly different, smaller um, and, sm and different habitat that these two fertilities are on. Uh, Pearl border, we don't have them any in South Wales. They used, they, they used to be in South, South or at least Southwest Wales, but now they're only in Mid North Wales. Um, um, but we do have quite a number of sites with small Pearl, board, small pearl border fertility, um, and they can only be told apart by the differences in their underlings. They also have a slightly different flight period. Pearl border comes out earlier than small pearls. Um, and they're more in um, open grass and habitats and small pearls often in, in damp habitats on our, on our lost pastures, purple more grass, uh, Russian purple more. And all of these fertilities feed on common dog violet. And then these two other varieties of, of violet that are, that are favored by a few of the Fertility species. Marsh violet, surprisingly, I'm sure you will find um, in damper habitats. Really big leaves, really easy to identify even when it's not flowering. Then we go on to the marsh fertility. Since 2004, so I could talk forever about marsh fertilities, but I won't. Um, so they are um, very different from the other. Fritillaries. They look different. They've got much more um, uh, variation of oranges and yellows and whites on their wings. Um, they're pretty small. Uh, they are every, at the beginning of the year, when I see them for the first time, I was kind of surprised at how small they are. And they like tussocky grassland, 
which is usually purple moor grass in Wales, but it can be any any tussocky grass, tufted hair grass in England as well, or even on chalk grasslands in England. So they don't need damp habitats everywhere, but here that's pretty much what they will use. And they their caterpillars only feed on devil's bit scabious, which is one of the things that, that um, you know, they're, as I said about these habitat specialists, they are um, very restricted because they only have one food plant. Occasionally they're found on other plants. Um, but it's the right structure of habitat, that tussocky, tall and short, um, that is actually the thing that limits them most because we've got quite a lot of devil's bit scabious in South Wales. Uh, in South Wales, well, across Wales, really. Um, but um, it's it having it in the right condition that is the problem for them. And they're a typical species that has declined because of uh, they only, they're not very mobile, so they get restricted to small patches. If they're lost from that patch, then there's none nearby. There used, there used to be no problem. They could just recolonize from nearby. But the more isolated they get, the less likely they are to survive. Drink. We move on to our skippers, and we've got they, they're sort of divided into into two groups. Three of them is that three of them that don't rest with their wings shut; they rest with them sort of half open. And then two other sort of moth-like species, grassland species, as I mentioned a minute ago. So we've got the three orange, um, orangey small small-ish skippers that are loads them out at the moment. Um, as long as you see them at rest and they do stop a lot, the large skipper is much more marked than the small or the Essex skipper. They're very plain. Um, so that's quite easy to tell them apart. Um, the Essex skipper, till recently, I would have said it's only in Southeast Wales. And when I, I teach a lot of courses on Gower, so I, I can say, you don't need to worry about Essex skipper, it's not here. But it is definitely spreading from Southeast Wales. So I think we need to keep more, more of an eye out. And they're a really tricky one. The only way you can tell them apart is by the color of the underside of their antennae. Small skipper is orange, Essex skipper is black. So they are a bit of a, a, bit of a tricky one. Close focus and binoculars would be very useful here. Taking photographs as well, if, you, if you're a good photographer and you can get a good photograph, is often a really good way you check them when you come back and then you can see those sort of little details. Um, and again, they're undersides. The large skipper will have more markings. It has these sort of almost like stained glass windows on the undersides. Small and Essex, very plain. And that's, yeah. But again, in these, even in these two photos, you can, you can, um, See the difference color on the antenna. And then the two more uh, moth-like species. These are, as I mentioned, these are usually spring flying, early spring flying, flying butterflies. Dingy skipper, which is very moth-like. And whenever, the first time I ever see it in the spring, I always have to stop and think, is that a moth? Is that? But that, that, that's what it looks like. And it likes um, bird's foot trefoil, either common on dry habitats or green. And then the lovely grizzled skipper, which feeds on wild strawberries. They're both declining because they like really open habitats like brownfield habitats um, and coal spoil habitats. Just, just to um, point you, if you don't know about the coal spoil biodiversity project in Southeast Wales, um, have a look at that. Liam Olds does fabulous work showing um, the huge range of species that are in those kind of really open habitats that are often um, targeted for development. And in England, apparently, they're, um, they're just, it's just gonna be a free for all of the new planning regulations, but that is, fortunately for us in Wales, that is only England, because those habitats just aren't protected at all, and they're really important. And the grizzled skipper particularly has really declined in that it's not on that many side by the same I hope you're not feeling too overwhelmed. We've got coppers, blues, and hair streaks to go, so not too many. But these are, I think these are the stars of the show. These are my favorite species. Um, so we've only got one copper butterfly in the UK. We used to have large skipper, but that has gone extinct. So start with that one, small copper. 
very easy to identify, very recognizable, very bright orange, very small. Um, several generations of year. I just saw one this week or last week. Um, and once they land, you can see them, they're just glowing orange you know, with those black spots. They don't look like the other orange butterflies. Um, and their food plant is very common, common sorrel. You can surely see more than one or two at a time. So instead of blue, quick mention that is only in Pembrokeshire and Northwest Wales. It has a range of food plants depending on what kind of habitat it, it is found in. It's got um, darker edges around the wings to distinguish it from our common blue butterfly. So these are the two in, in most of, in Southeast Wales, these are the two blue butterflies that you will come across. Um, common blue, which is a grassland species, again, bird's foot trefoils. Um, lovely bright blue males, and it can look often very um, kind of almost purpley lavendery. This, this photo shows it quite lavendery. Um, um, the female is brown with orange spots, and she always has a tinge of, at least a tinge of blue. Sometimes she can have quite a lot of blue. And remember that for the next species we're going to look at. Um, and then the other blue butterfly you'll see is the holly blue. Um, which lays the first generation, it lays its eggs on holly, the second on ivy. Um, but it looks, it looks very different. Often the problem is you just see a bit of blue as it flies by. But um, common blue tend to fly lower to the ground across grasslands. Holly blue fly higher up at the head height or even higher and much more along the edges of hedgerows and shrubs. And, um, and once they land, their undersides are very different. So here on the um, right, we'll see the underside of the common blue. And I'll, show, I'll go back to the holly blue in a minute because they look very different from each other. Um, the problem is in identification is the brown argus, which does look very similar to a female common blue. So um, in Wales, they're mostly coastal or nearish. North Wales. There are some records from um, west of Wales as well. They feed on common rock rows. Um, and I think it's probably the, I, like many species, it's the food plant that limits them to where they're found, the kind of habitats they're found in. Um, I, I, was fine, I, I think brown argus is quite a, I don't want to say, a kind of smarter, sharper, cleaner blue than the common blue female. They can occasionally look at, have a bit of a blue sheen on them, but um, not as blue as the female common blue. And their orange spots are a bit different and a bit brighter. Um, the undersides are really difficult to tell apart. And the main feature is what I've got circled, that the brown argus has this little um, pair, close, close little pair or figure of eight common blue doesn't have them. That is quite tricky. And then our other species um, of blue is um, the small blue butterfly. Lovely little butterfly, which is upper wings are brown, um, but its underside is very blue. Um, and so I'm just reminding you again of the holy blue. Their undersides look quite similar, but they're in very different habitats and could be mistaken, but um, they're holy blues, blue. Um, and a whale, small blue, is coastal and it only lays its eggs on kidney vetch and the, the larvae feed on the flowers of the uh, kidney vetch rather than the leaves. Okay, and a final group, I think, the hair streaks. We've got four species in whales um, and they've all got this little sort of tail which is why they're called a hair streak. Um, most of them are, are difficult to find just because they all live on different trees and so they tend to be quite high flying. Um, we've got a white letter hair streak here, which um, underside you can see that white W gives it its name and it feeds on elms, and particularly witch elms. So there was a lot of concern about um, the future of this butterfly with Dutch elm disease. Um, in fact, they seem to be doing okay, as far as I know. They're, um, 
can survive quite happily on the on the shoots and the saplings as as elm because elm certainly witch elm and in Wales I think witch elm hasn't been hasn't suffered quite so badly as as perhaps in other parts of the country um, that um, it will send up shoots and won't grow to be a really tall tree but so the main tree they might die these shoots and they seem to be able to survive on that. There are also people um, growing, trying to grow resistant species of elms to help with their hair streak. Um, the purple hair streak, it's not rare, but it spends months with very hard to see. So if you can get anywhere we can get above the oak trees, um, it's a fat. It is really pretty spectacular with this very purpley sheen on it. Um, and its underside is, is very different from the other ones. You can occasionally see them on the ground that come down to um, get moisture, I think. And recently I have seen um, females, the, the bluer ones, uh, sorry, males rather, um, the bluer ones on the right, um, sort of caught on the ground. They've obviously come down to the ground and then clouds come over or it's gone cooler and they get a bit stuck because they're not warm enough to be able to fly back up to the tree. Um, and then brown hair streaks. So Southwest Wales is a, um, I, I didn't want to overwhelm you with images, so I haven't shown you distributions of other species, but show you this now so you can see um, it's very restricted to certain parts of the country and South, uh, South and West Wales is a really important spot where this um, butterfly and butterfly conservation, South Wales organized lots and lots of surveys. You can survey for their eggs. So it's a bit of a, bit of because you can do it, you do it in the winter when um, the leaves have fallen off the um, black thumb that they feed on, so you can see them, and it gets very competitive, and it's a really enjoyable thing <laughs> to do, and it's um, given us so much information that we've um, been able to um, see that they're, they've got a wider distribution than we thought, but they need really appropriate management because they um, lay their eggs on last year's shoots, and so many of our hedgerows just get slaughtered um, by a mechanical. Um, cutting um, and it's a real problem for black thorn. I mean for um, black brown hair streak um, and again occasionally you can see them landed low to the ground. So all three of these look very different from the underneath but it's just seeing them it's a problem. Um, the one that's much more widespread streak and it's as you can see it's on lots of different kinds of habitats where it feeds on lots of different food plants but it's so well, it's really well camouflaged because it's green, it's on the green butterfly. And it flies quite early in the year. So I think it's also um, just brought my, out very much so that it, I think it's quite under recorded. Um, in Wales, it um, often feeds on um, bilberry on heathlands and its wings are exactly the same color as the bilberry leaves. So again, that can make it really difficult. It's actually upper side, which you, hardly ever see, I couldn't even find a photograph, one photograph that I didn't have permission to use of the upper side as brown, it's only the underwings that are green, but it has a very brown look when it flies. So that can, um, so you can look out for that. And um, in the case of the sites, I know it, um, like our, like Welsh Morts, it always tends to be around the ed edges of, of the heath um, on the building. And that's that. I have no idea how long that took, but thank you all so much. Thanks, Sue Brett, for um, asking me. Thank you all for um, coming, and I hope that wasn't just too quick and too much of a whirlwind. But I will stop sharing now. Hello, there you are. Thank you, Deborah. I really enjoyed that. Yeah. Um, we do have, I guess, saw one question at least coming in the chat. Uh, I'll start with that one. Uh, Rachel M said, you've mentioned Rachel. habitat fragmentation. What sort of flying distances can or do butterflies manage? Different with different species. So marsh fertility. Um, I think they have been known to fly a number of kilometers, but generally they'll only fly maybe one, one or two kilometers. And that's, that is one of the reasons why they're struggling because they just can't spread into new habitat and uh, and one of the real problems with um one of the reasons the butterflies that cannot take advantage of climate change is there might be suitable habitat for them further north or further uphill but they can't get there because they just don't fly um fly that far so you've got the 
um, painted ladies that will fly from the UK to south of the Sahara in the autumn. And then you've got other ones that will only fly one or two kilometers. Wonderful. Um, that's the only question from on the chat. So does anybody have any questions they'd like to ask Deborah on Zoom? Gosh. You can uh, unmute yourself if you want to, um, to ask out loud or you can type in the chat as well if you prefer. Um, I'd like to ask a question. Um, uh, those slides were so fascinatingly interesting, particularly where um, the, the, she identified the, the butterfly with the grass and uh, all the different kinds of habitats that each butterfly um, uh, sort of thrives in. And I was wondering if there was any um, information that we could have about this, um, uh, this, this Zoom meeting so that we can refer back to it again as a reference point in terms of the slides and all the, uh, the, the relevant information that went with them. We, we can, do you want to say, Amy? Uh, yeah, so the, with this whole um, Zoom meeting, of course, happening, it's being recorded, and I'm going to put it on YouTube. So uh, probably by Monday, um, you'll be able to watch it back on YouTube if you want to see the slides again. Oh, lovely. And can I just say, it's such a super, super informative talk. Thank you so much, Deborah. I've really enjoyed it. Loved it. Oh, good. Thank you. Oh, that's, that's really good. <laughs> uh, so, so a couple of similar questions have come up in the chat as well. So someone else asking if the flies would be shared, which we've covered. Um, Peter Crabb says, fantastic talk, Deborah. The, the... So much easier to ID butterflies from now on. We'll probably watch it on YouTube. Um, Diana has asked in the chat, is hogweed useful to any butterfly? We are plagued with it this year. Um, not, not as a food plant, no. I've, I find most of those kind of their um, umbellifers with the small flowers, they're, they're good for small bees and um, flies. I mean, they're really, they're really important plants for pollinators, but not particularly for butterflies. Different um, pollinators have different length tongues and butterflies have a really long tongue. And so those little open flowers are probably more attractive to species with short tongues. But um, tolerate your, at least some of your hogweed because it's, it's, it is an important food, uh, uh, nectar plant for adults, uh, insect adults. Uh, lots more people saying thank you, marvelous presentation, really useful talk. Uh, and then another question from David Ashman. I have a large patch of nettles in my garden. When can I cut them down without harming butterflies? Ah, that's a, well, that's, that's a good question. That's quite tricky because um, I don't know. <laughs> um, I suppose when they, when, oh, no, I was going to say, I suppose at the end of the flight season, but it wouldn't be because of the, if it's a food plant. <laughs> yeah, they, well, over winter, I don't know. I can I can um, get back to you about. I'll check and get back to you because that's a good question because they have several generations a year, so they're laying their eggs on them, and then the cat and then the caterpillars. Um, that's a bit hard to know, but it's a good question because I've got a lot of nettles that will need some <laughs> cutting back at some point too. Um, yeah, maybe we could send out. I, I was also going to say, Amy, maybe I, we could just send out copies of the. Um, the slide sheets and the um, resources and the apps. So maybe if you want, I'll, um, I'll, I'll, have, I'll, I'll consult with my colleagues and, um, and see if I can find out. Good question. Yeah, we should be able to send, we've got the email addresses of everybody who's here. So um, yeah, we can send the Make slides. Note. Mm -hmm. uh, another question from the chat from Andrew Bevan. Are there intervention programs in place to help the habitat specific species spread to other suitable areas? Um, yeah, yeah, lots and lots. There's a lot of work and, and not just butterfly conservation, but lots of conservation organizations um, have been working very hard on um, improving management and working, um, particularly, I think, over the last, I don't know, 20 years now, people realizing you have to, that's why you have to work over the wider countryside, that nature reserves aren't enough because um, they're almost like zoos and you've got to get land landowners managing their land property and there's a huge amount of effort goes in into that. Uh, Butterfly Conservation recently had started doing some reintroductions um, which they uh, 
if you do that, you have to make sure all that habitat management and um, sufficient amount of habitat is all in place. You have to address the reason why they went extinct in the first place before you reintroduce them. And that's a, a really big effort. But yeah, it's a, it's a prime focus of wildlife conservation organizations to manage habitats for um, butterflies and other species. The problem is it's hard to manage for everything. So that's the, um, the tricky part of conservation is, um, you know, which, what do you know by managing for one species, you might be harming another and you've got to try to come to some happy medium. But habitat management is the most important thing rather than species management, because then you're, you're managing for a whole range of species. Um, another question from Lorna West. I currently have a chrysalis on the wall in my house and it's been there for a few weeks. Is it still alive? Yeah, that's, they will, um, that's what they do. And then depending on what the species is, it may not emerge until next year now. Um, yeah, just leave it and keep an eye on it and see what happens. Right. And a butterfly will hopefully eventually come out. Lots more people saying thank you. Um, Jenny has asked, are you going to be working with Bug Life's Bee Lines project? Are there any interesting butterfly specific plans upcoming with that? Um, ask, I mean, I, I have done a little bit with Bug Life, but um, when it, ask them, I mean, they're doing, they're doing lots of work. I know they've created a, a um, certainly I was involved in a mapping for um, Bee Lines projects on Gower. And, um, are doing it all over the place but um get in touch with bug life they do lots and lots of lots of good work um, have a look at their website there's a um a uk wide bug life and then bug life cymru in wales okay bye perhaps if we do um send an email with some of these um slides we can add a, a link to bug life and um include the link that elaine shared earlier i don't know if anyone saw um to leah Mould's, um Colorist uh, initiative that Deborah mentioned in her talk as well. Really good. good. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Elaine. Um, Megan Evans. Sorry, Deborah. Sorry. What are you saying? Uh, Megan Evans has asked if you wanted to get lots of food plants, like a variety of grasses, grasses and violets. Where would you get them? Um. Well, something interesting was just been announced is the National Botanic Garden of Wales have just started um, a um, sort of verification program for pollinator friendly plants so not so much for grasses but um, for um, all sorts of um, important um, certainly uh, nectar plants so that are verifying that they've been grown without chemicals and without um, um, and they haven't used peat so the so peat bogs haven't been destroyed to grow them. Um, and so they're starting to encourage um, garden centers and specialist suppliers to join the scheme. And then they'll have a, a, they have a little sticker to put on the plant so you know they're safe because there's a real problem. I was, if I'd done my full um, talk, I was gonna talk about some of, the, some of the pesticides that are on plants, even plants, um, wildflower plants and even plants that are sold, advertised as suitable for pollinators, and it turns out they attract pollinators and then they harm them. Um, so I would always advise if you can afford it, organic plants, because then you know they don't have those pesticides on them. And there's a number of wild plant and um, um, organic seed suppliers, even some of the organic vegetable seed suppliers also sell some wildflowers. Um, and yeah, grass mixes as well. I'm sure there, there are people that, that will supply like a meadow mix or something like that. And that's an important thing because diversity of grasses, we always talk about, I think a, a lot of the focus has been on pollinators. So plants have produced a lot of nectar. It's not necessarily butterfly food plants. And we don't look at the diversity of the grasses. And as you said, that's really you know, good that you point that out, that it's those grasses that are also important for butterflies. Excellent. And also we're doing a grasses course this time next yeah. Friday. Which yeah. is <laughs> but it's but it's full apparently. It is full, yes. Yeah. So hopefully, if you're interested, you've already booked a place in that one. Yeah. But it but you'll put it on. Um, yeah, same as today. Uh, that will be on YouTube, YouTube as well. So if you don't have a space for that and you are interested, you can watch it on YouTube after probably a week Monday. Probably that will be on YouTube. Um, K 
Kate Jenkins has asked for orange tip, would cutting of a hay crop and the removal of the cuckoo flower stalks take out the pupae that are overwintering? Um, yes, probably. I'm not sure if they, that's something else I would have to check if they, um, I can actually look that up if you want. Um, I'm going on and on about Peter Eels's book. Um, they may actually um, like crawl down to over, they probably, actually, they probably don't overwinter on the stalks just off the top of my head because that would be, they'd be really vulnerable up there to the cold. So they probably, let's just see what it tells us. So it's got lots of information about their life cycle. Mm, doesn't say, doesn't say. So, but I think, um, but make sure you, make sure you, well, hopefully you've allowed it to set its seed already and, um, and have a look and just as long as, look, look, and could you, if it is on the stem, then you'd see the, the, um, pu the chrysalis on there. So as long as it's not on there, then you'd be okay cutting them. Um, Becky Wright Davis, who is a Zubrek, Remember, has asked any thoughts on home butterfly eg painted ladies raising kits for kids that can be bought now uh, the adults are presumably released yeah i read um, a few things recently it's a bit tricky because it's obviously really important to get kids interested and excited but um one of the um the things that, that we often don't think about with cons conserving it's not just conserving certain species, but it's conserving local genetic diversity. So species are, are suited to where they're from. And if you start releasing things, um, you're, br you're bringing in different genetics that we really don't know what the, the um, effect of that would be. And they might not, you know, the species like that, I mean, they could be from anywhere. They could be from somewhere in the middle of Europe or something, the stalk. Um, so I would be very cautious about that. But, but I understand that it, it's great to educate people, uh, educate kids about them. Um, as I said, there's lots of, it's very fashionable to like release butterflies at weddings. And um, yeah, I don't, I really don't think that's a good idea, personally. Okay, uh, the last question from the chat that I can see now is from Megan Evans. Are there any plants that you would encourage everyone to get to help pollinate population? <laughs> well, there's so many different ones. Birdfoot trefoil is a really good plant. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, it depends. Maybe think about what's in your area. If you go on to the, um, so Subrec is part of uh, um, all, the, all the Welsh re um, record centers are all joined together and they have a website called Adairin. AD, and it's got distribution maps. So again, this is why recording is so important because otherwise we don't know what is where. Um, and if you look on there and look, you can see, look at um, where you live, near, near where you live, see what's around you um, and maybe plant, you know, plant things that are suitable to your local species or maybe if there's something in particular you want to attract or something um, that you know is nearby or something needing um, uh, you know, needing help. Devil's bit scabious is another great plant because as well as being a food plant, for, uh, you, you, depending where you are, artillery, but it's a fabulous nectar plant. It flowers late in the year. The ones in my garden uh, haven't even opened yet um, when most of the other flowers have gone over. Knapweed and, and um, Devil's bit scabious are really important nectar plants for all sorts of pollinators later in the summer. They'll be, they, they'll be covered and they're often covered with things like um, painted ladies and red admirals and Wonderful. And another question has just come up from Diana. Uh, we have marsh artillery butterfly in our fields. I see the butterfly um, and the webs and caterpillars, but have never seen a chrysalis. Where do they hide? Um, they so the reason they like need tussocky grasses is because they um, uh, the caterpillars will hibernate. They live as a group, and um, in usually sort of mid late September. They'll actually go deep down in the tussock and they'll spin a web around themselves and they'll hibernate in there. So they need that um, sheltered and drier um, 
little secret site and they hibernate there over the winter and or come out in early spring. So that's why you need not really dense tussocky, but you need some sort of, um, you don't want it like mown short um, because they need those, those taller bits to hibernate in. Where are you, Diana? Hello, Deborah. We're, in, we're just north of Athtualis. In fact, you came and did our, you did our dormouse habitat. Oh, so. hello. Hiya. Hiya. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was particularly the chrysalis I could never find. I find the webs and I find all the caterpillars. Oh, the right. Where? Yeah, they're very hard. Oh, right. They're very, sorry, chrysalis you were asking about. They're very hard, hard to find. I've never seen one. Oh, good. So, okay, um, that doesn't make yeah. me feel so bad then. <laughs> Yeah, they're beautiful too. They're really, really, um, really beautiful colored. But yeah, yeah, no, they're, they're not I spent easy hours. Find. I spent hours looking for the chrysalis. So I find, you know, the butterfly, the, the webs and the caterpillars. I see them all, yeah, you know, yeah, always. Yeah. But I've never seen a chrysalis, and I've spent hours and hours. But if you've never seen one, yeah, that no, makes me feel happen. much better. Yeah. <laughs> it would be in um, sort of April, April, May time. But yeah, no, they're hard to find. Thank you. Okay, anything else? No, there aren't any others in the chat, so unless anybody wants to ask anything else, there's lots of people in the chat saying thank you. What a wonderful thank talk, you. how much they enjoyed it, which I'll second. That's good. It's, so, it's just so odd doing these courses because I can't see any of you while I'm talking. <laughs> and so it's just talking in the void and I just think, oh, well, they might have all gotten bored and gone away or something. So thank you very much. That's good to know. All right. We'll see um, some of you next week, hopefully. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, thank you very much for coming, everybody.